A very good morning to everyone. So uh, we begin our day two session uh, of Scientifica with some research. So our first session for today is going to be bio facilitators and barriers of conducting health research in India. So for that, uh, we the organizers would really like to apologize for a little change in the schedule. Uh, so uh, we were uh, unfortunately Dr. Arun Maya sir will not be joining us today for this particular panel, but Fortunately enough, uh, we have Dr. John Solomon sir, uh, who'd be, who would be uh, joining us for this panel. So uh, let's begin a session. Uh, before that, I would like to introduce our, chair per <clears throat> our chairperson, uh, Dr. Saurabh Sharma. So Dr. Saurabh, uh, he is an uh, international association for the study of pain. John J. Bonica, postdoctoral uh, research fellow, studying complex uh, pain conditions at Neuroscience Research Australia uh, of, and the University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. Uh, he has also completed his PhD in New Zealand, which was marked as a thesis of exceptional quality. Dr. Sharma has published over 50 peer reviewed papers and has received more than uh, 400,000 Australian uh, uh, grants. Uh, uh, research grants. He is one of the commissioners for the Lancet Commission on Osteoarthritis. He has also contributed to the WHO initiatives and two book chapters on pain and osteoarthritis. He is also an active member of the three IASP committees. He is an editorial board member of the IASP Pain Research Forum. He is an IASP task force member for 2022 Global Year for Translating Pain Knowledge and Practice. We are very glad to have you, sir, today. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Ratsana, for a very kind introduction. I'm very happy uh, and delighted to be part of this wonderful session. And thank you very much for this invitation to chair this important panel discussion, which is on, as you said, facilitators and barriers of conducting uh, health research in India. So first, uh, let me quickly summarize some housekeeping. So I would really appreciate if you could keep your uh, uh, mics on mute when you're not speaking, that would help uh, all the other speakers. And uh, please raise your hand uh, if uh, you need to ask questions. And for those who are not in the panel member, yeah, please post your questions on the chat. Uh, and I think Dr. Rachana might uh, guide with how uh, best to post uh, different questions. Uh, you may also... Uh, um, yeah, and all the questions, um, I think it would be best to address at the end of the talk. So the overall session is all organized into two different halves. So for the first half, each speaker will, uh, um, based on their experience, will speak about barriers, barriers and facilitator for five minutes, uh, each in turn. And at the end, uh, the panel will come together and, and uh, discuss uh, the barriers and facilitators. And also I'll facilitate questions uh, from, from the audience and also from the panel itself. Um, so first, let me introduce each speaker. So the first uh, speaker for uh, this morning or afternoon is Dr. John Solomon. And Dr. John Solomon was our, uh, when I was a master's student in India, he was the course coordinator for MPT first year and he's always been very lovely and kind and also a wonderful uh, teacher and uh, influencer on research. So uh, Dr. John is the head of the Department of Physiotherapy, Manipal University, College of Health Professional, Mahe Manipal. He is also the coordinator for Center for Comprehensive Stroke Rehab and Research. He graduated from SRI, SRIPMS, Coimbatore, and he was the gold medalist. He completed his master's degree specializing in neurological physiotherapy in 2003 and a PhD on virtual reality and training for co in coordination from Mahe in 2010. He has more than 20 years of teaching, uh, clinical and research experience in neuro rehab. He's a very active researcher. His research focuses on strategies to improve uh, motor recovery after stroke, use of technology and implementation of evidence-based practice. He's a member of various international working groups on stroke rehab and has been very actively involved in developing stroke rehab strategies for low-income countries. He's a key member in various international research groups and initiatives. This include executive board member for International Stroke uh, Rehabilitation and Research Alliance, reviewer for stroke rehabilitation package developed by World Health Organization, 
member of Stroke Rehabilitation Research Roundtable Consensus Group, member of International Research Group on Physical Activity in Stroke, and member of Global Consortium for Stroke Rehab in Low and Middle Income Countries. He has conducted four international and five Indian funded projects and has published over 52 peer reviewed scientific papers. That's wonderful achievements, sir. Uh, welcome, welcome to the group. Um, the second speaker for uh, uh, today is Dr. Sudha Srinivasan. Dr. Sudha is an associate, uh, sorry, assistant professor in the physical therapy program within the Department of Kinesiology at the University of Connecticut, uh, USA. Dr. Srinivasan teaches courses on pediatric physical therapy, motor control, biomechanics, and rehab practices. Dr. Srinivasan did her bachelor's and master's degree in physiotherapy in India. She specializes in neuro neuroscience. She completed a PhD in kinesiology from the University of Connecticut in uh, uh, 2014. She has had two postdoc experience, one at the University of Delaware in the US and the second at the IIT Bombay, India, in which uh, she was involved in an UNICEF uh, funded project. Dr. Srinivasan is an expert in the area of autism uh, spectrum disorder or AST. Her research interest includes early detection of AST and the development of novel movement-based behavioral intervention for children with AST. Specifically, her research focuses on developing music and movement-based creative interventions for AST and developing assistive technologies such as communication aids for non-verbal and minimally verbal children with AST. Uh, thank you, Dr. Suda, uh, Suda for uh, joining the group, and I kindly welcome you. Our next speaker, or the third speaker uh, for the session, is Dr. Soman Gupta. Dr. Soman is an associate professor of geriatric and pediatric rehab at Sikkim Manipal College of Physiotherapy, India. His primary research uh, area is aging with disability. As a part of his doctoral thesis or study, he profiled physical functioning in adolescents and adults with cere cerebral palsy. He has developed a therapeutic approach to treat adolescents and adults with cerebral palsy. His active area of research includes understanding how children with developmental disorder process the information to plan their motor activities and how their ability changes with aging. He has also jointly developed an assessment tool for children with developmental di coordinate, uh, coordination disorder. Dr. Gupta has published his research papers in reputed peer-reviewed national and international uh, journals. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Soman uh, Gupta, for joining the team. Welcome. Our fourth and final speaker uh, for the morning and afternoon is Dr. Ramakrishnan Mani. Um, I was very honored and privileged to publish my first, very first paper with Dr. Mani. So uh, thank you for all the help and support then. Dr. Mani is the current Associate Dean of Undergraduate Physical, sorry, Physiotherapy Studies at the School of Physiotherapy, University of Otago, and is also a senior lecturer in the same uh, department. He teaches musculoskeletal and pain curriculum in both undergraduate and postgraduate physiotherapy programs at Otago. Dr. Mani's research program aims to understand neural mechanisms, driving pain experience, and testing interventions that target neural factors to improve clinical outcomes in people with chronic musculoskeletal pain. He also leads the Otago Pain Mechanism Research Group, and he's also the um, director for the Pain Otago Research Team, which is an innovative uh, interdisciplinary research group within the University of Otago. He supervises several PhD, master's and honors research program and mentors, postdoctoral research fellow. He also has produced more than 120 research output and attracted international and external research funding, which also includes New Zealand Health Research Council grants. His other service roles include membership in the executive committee of New Zealand Pain Society and International Association Association for the Study of Pain or IASP subcommittees. He also serves as an edit editorial board member for BMC Musculoskeletal Disorders and has uh, conducted and has been conducting uh, peer review for several high impact uh, pain and international physiotherapy journals. So thank you, Dr. Mani, for uh, joining the panel. 
So without um, any further delay, I would uh, like to invite our very first speaker for the day. So uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Uh, John Solomon. We are very excited to hear your talk. Thank you. Dr. Sarab, it was a pleasure and thank you for your kind words and introduction. Uh, can you have my slides, please? Thank you very much. Uh, a very good morning to all of you. So I will be talking on uh, my perspective on uh, facilitators and barriers when it comes to in specific physiotherapy research. And the talk will be based on my experience here at Mahi. Next slide, please. So in 2016, there was an article published uh, by Dr. Hari Om and his team on research productivity of Indian physiotherapists. So they reviewed what are the published uh, articles in Medline between 2000 to 2014. And they found there is a gradual growth in the amount of research output among Indian physiotherapists. It started with about 27 studies for the first five years and gradually increased to 182 in the remaining years. And in that, um, our university, Mahi, was contributing for about 59 articles. And uh, later, so what I wanted to look at was uh, what happened after that. So because this was a critical juncture, this paper was published in 2016 and they looked at 2014. And we know that we, we in our uh, institution, we were moving towards a change in policy. So. I just wanted to look at what changed and we found, I saw that the number of articles, I couldn't check Medline, but in Scopus, between 2015 to 2021, we had about 407 publication, which is about 15 fold increase. And uh, from grants of 40 lakhs or so, it has increased up to seven rows and about 2200 projects. Next slide. So I wanted to look at what facilitated this uh, growth. Uh, can you go to the next slide? So, in two, till 2015, uh, if you look at it, one of the, the common facilitators were always there, the infrastructure, in, in the interdisciplinary research environment, uh, support system from the administration. But primarily, till 2015, it was driven by personal interest. So, the first, in, first facilitator is the uh, personal interest from the faculty or the student to do research. Um, and that continues even now. The second important thing was the institutional uh, focus or policy change. So the most important thing I believe is the institution policies and environment that drives uh, research. So in 2016, they came up with a Vision 2020 plan, or uh, which later shifted to Vision 2032, where they decided to look at ranking, achieving higher ranks of university. And one of the main pillar identified was the research. So to drive research, they incentivize the faculty publications or research, whether they are getting funding or whether they are publishing also. And they start supporting with small intramural funding. So which could do some short projects and could get published. And they start opening more full-time PhD students. So every PhD student writes an entrance and they get into a full-time PhD program, which is supported by a uh, uh, scholarship. And that, again, this number of PhD students has increased the number of research projects also increased. And I was at the uh, uh, research chairperson at, during this time, and our involvement was to improve the research environment. So more training program, and so hands on hand on, uh, hand guidance, all those were the focus. So institutional focus is the second thing. Then if you look at it, the, the uh, cost of research and funding avenues were also improving. And uh, this brought in more collaborators, both international people tying up, looking at the work that is done and that the, um, that the research can be done at a much lower cost. Whereas industries also started coming into play, especially with the new programs supported by the government, there are more uh, seed grants for innovative products and testing it. So industry wanted to tie up with more health institutions and there were more collaborators. 
and then there was a new brand of students who were interested to do research because they know that if they publish if they do some uh, presentations they get scholarships when they go abroad next slide please these were the major facilitators but when it comes to barriers as a whole i would say uh, there are four main barriers personal barriers resource barriers access barriers and administrative barriers each of this varies in institution wise so personal barriers including starting with uh, um, the uh, confidence uh, the interest to do it and the training the resource barriers include the infrastructure funding available experts in team and access barrier especially uh, literature access for the various databases statistical experts software access to participants and also administrative barriers mm -hmm. where all the um, ethics board review board grant office and then the space for research these are not available in most of the institutions and becomes a barrier to conduct research and when we address these things this would be with that i would uh, like to uh, stop my talk my time is up thank you very much thank you uh, dr john solomon that is really interesting we'll have more chat about uh, the topic again at the end of uh, the uh, presenter's talk so i'd like to invite our next speaker uh, for the session dr sudha srinivasan uh, the online platform is all yours thank you so much um, dr saurabh and uh, you know i can't stress enough how uh, dr john solomon has laid the you know foundation an excellent foundation for all of us and started the session at a great note so i would like to share some of my perspectives and a lot of things are sort of overlapping and uh, have been covered by him as well but i would like to highlight some main points that i have found in terms of my experiences in trying to do research in india so let me start with the positives and the plus points so in terms of the biggest facilitators for me i think the diversity so we are a population of over 1.3 billion and so that itself is the diversity of the population itself i think is a big strength because when you think about patient populations and trying to do clinical research there's no dearth of patients you know you have access to all sorts of patients all unique types of cases and so i think that's a big uh, plus point and that is also a plus point in terms of just you know human power we just have a great talent pool and if you know if research is is emphasized then we are you know there's no beat because no matter you see this panel today here that half of the people are all abroad right and so there are you know the talent wise uh, there's no comparison and there's no beat to the indian talent um i would also say that one of the you know big plus points is that the problems of the country the research issues that one would want to study are very unique right so we are a developing country we have very unique issues that when i was doing my postdoc at iit bombay i felt like there is a lot that we can impact if there were the right facilities available if we could strike the right interdisciplinary collaborations um so i would say that you know those for me were the big facilitators the diversity of the population the talent pool that we have uh, the fact that we are uniquely placed and are a developing country and you know our problems are pretty unique now let me talk a little bit about the challenges that i faced when i started trying to list down the challenges for me everything boiled down to awareness about research so awareness about research among students among uh, you know healthcare professionals among patient population so there is the culture of research isn't there and i'm so glad that uh, dr john solomon presented the manipal experience because that is i think a model institute that can be uh, used sort of as a benchmark as you know of other institutes trying to emulate that sort of model where you have an interdisciplinary institute where you have the medical school you have a technology engineering school which naturally fosters interdisciplinary collaboration so i think um, you know right from the fact that when i was doing my postdoc at iit i was really fortunate to be housed in an institute that values research so there was infrastructure that was provided towards research they had a mindset for interdisciplinary collaborations which i found was really hard uh, when it's just a medical center um, and students might not have experience to different domains even 
interprofessional education across different other healthcare professions is also lacking um and so that i feel is 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 another big um, limitation and you know many a times what i have seen is that people tend to work in silos it's very easy to get into those silos and it's it's difficult to be able to break those barriers and build those interdisciplinary uh, collaborations finally one more point that i would like to highlight is the difficulty in finding funding so um, you know there are grants through dst through dbt uh, but you know in in terms of for instance i can say in the us that there are a lot more foundations there are a lot more private organizations that can fund research um and that's something which i found hard uh, to sort of to 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 get access to uh, in india and finally there are institutes like iits like iisc like manipal uh, that are setting the model for interdisciplinary research but especially the technology institutes my experience with them has been that they they realize interdisciplinarity but they might not widely recruit healthcare faculty so trying to be able to get into those institutes to make use of their infrastructure is sometimes a challenge so i'll stop here because i think i've run out of my time but the, those were sort of my main issues that i wanted to bring up for this discussion thank you very much thank you dr suda i can't agree more a lot we can impact in developing countries like india and nepal uh, that's where i i'm from which i didn't mention earlier so uh, i would like to thank you for your wonderful uh, uh, talk and summary i'd like to now next invite dr soman gupta in the introduction i forgot to mention that dr soman gupta was also part of manipal and he taught me how to use endnote and we changed my life on how to reference and make uh, made scientific writing really easy so dr soman gupta uh, the online platform is all yours um just a minute yeah uh welcome all thank you for uh, inviting me as a panelist i hope you are able to see my screen and you are able to hear me yes yes we can so uh, i have uh, you know journeyed through being a research associate from a postgraduate to research associate and then uh, you know heading or being a part of uh, you know uh, several grants and uh, a uh, grant funded research and then uh, i have been a, uh, working as a faculty and now i lead post graduates and uh, phd's so i have uh, a few things which overlap with dr john solomon dr sudha and of course with uh, dr ram um that is uh, i will explain the barriers in a little different way um all of you have been you know whatever talks have been happening uh they are insisting on uh, you know literature or insisting on lack of interdisciplinary stuff uh i see them as barriers i can bucket them or categorize them in terms of lack of infrastructure or uh, you know organizational constraints and uh, and i can also put some blame on our educational system so uh, we have got uh, you know bare minimum infrastructure because we do not have a central body so which uh, restricts us in having some kind of fixed criteria to run the courses um it includes uh, undergraduate postgraduate and phd and now uh, since uh, everybody wants you know good faculties they are running towards phd's but then we do not know what's the quality of the phd we are churning out uh most of the higher education institutes do not have labs meaning uh, the necessary labs um, i'll give you an example of assistive technology lab we lack lab work at certain areas uh then i come to manpower and organizational goals mismatch when you're working for a big university uh you will always have uh you know uh, you have to negotiate with uh, you know organizational demands and your personal things you want to take forward your research and you are loaded with lectures so faculty strength faculty strength has always been you know a uh, constraint for uh, you know having an interest in research because you are uh, you know you have to put emphasis on teaching and learning uh, rather than research whether you are recognized as a research institute or whether you are recognized as a teaching institute okay so if you look at the quality of the research being coming out is always you know some kind of function of 
how much time you get how much uh, you know, uh, you know you have got students and how much load is on you then i come to faculty attrition uh, faculty attrition again uh, many of our young faculties they are looking for uh, you know higher pay raise or they are looking for you know climbing up the ladder but then it's not possible in certain systems then you have faculty or students um, they have no time left after uh, their teaching and learning process and uh, you know they cannot endure research work because it requires a whole lot of time and it also has got cultural implications when you come from a background or a part of the country where competition is you know uh, there then probably you uh, you know get people who are interested in research but then when you come to a different part of a country or you aware you know there is no competition then probably will you know find 9 to 5 or office hours job work okay people may not be interested in research work uh, then i come down to the reading habit we need to widen scope and uh, i see there is no effort on widening scope of rehabilitation as per physiotherapy and uh, i come down to students interest um, they are not doing research because they want to do it they are just you know mandatorily they have to be as a part of research team in post graduation that's why they are doing it otherwise they are looking for you know jobs okay and we do not have consistent mentorship that is also one of the barriers in uh, uh, your research process because we do not have apprentice system Let's come to challenges. When you are unable to negotiate with the barriers, it appears as challenges. Okay, so I will say we have educational constraint. We have got personal factor constraint. We have got uh, we have got to lobby our uh, you know physiotherapy and rehabilitation into the national infrastructure framework, and then we need to you know build special interest groups. we have limitation of syllabus we lack horizontal mobility that is we have masters you have post graduation you have masters you have phd in physiotherapy but then we lack uh, you know horizontal mobility if suppose you have understanding of uh, technological sciences probably you should be having a dual degree program we have uh, no so man sorry to interrupt but we just have uh, okay. 15 or 20 seconds more sure then uh, we do not have uh, you know uh, basic amenities or we are not advancing basic sciences because physiotherapy is a derived science we need to give more focus on basic sciences we do not have interdisciplinary education and we do not want to go extra mile to improve upon it we lack uh, we lack uh, experimental creativity and uh, we lack apprenticeship in our research system so what our facilitators are i think um many of you may not be aware of it but uh, i just want to emphasize give me 30 seconds more yeah we have nac accreditation of under uh, you know undergraduate and postgraduate courses and universities this uh, accreditation has changed the whole uh, environment now people are more focusing on research so it becomes a facilitator we have got lot of grant funding bodies and we have got grants for rehabilitation from icmr seed grants are available through universities and currently we have national education policy 2020 which has introduced open electives and valued courses so now if suppose you do not have certain subjects in your curricula then probably you can you know or choose these open elective courses which suit your understanding and improve your knowledge now uh, since nac and nep have emphasized more on having mous with regional institutes now we have more labs becoming accessible to smaller institutes so probably if you pool uh, larger universities with smaller universities probably we would be able to have a good mou and clear objective in persuasion of research so a way forward is have more value added courses with amalgamation from technical faculties have clear objectives and mou and we can share our resources so that's all from my side thank you thank you dr soman it is quite interesting to know there are so many uh facilitators and india is heading towards positive direction which is wonderful and uh, now i'd like to welcome our last speaker dr ram